at uh, Ket Labs here in Bristol. And working with Dondu Sahin, it's been my pleasure to help coordinate and chair this evening, this afternoon's uh, industry session. We have three talks uh, this afternoon. And uh, the session, this industry session, is actually sponsored by the Bristol University of Bristol Quantum Technology Enterprise Centre. And uh, we close this session by hearing a little more about QTech from its director, Andy Collins, later. And uh, to start us, we have Thomas Arul speaking from Atos. Atos are a worldwide IT solutions provider. And uh, Thomas is going to explain why Atos will be helping you when you uh, how to be quantum ready when you uh, come to access your first quantum computer. Thank you, Graham, for, for the introduction and for the kind inv invitation to this nice workshop. It's also my first time in Bristol, and I'm, I had a really great time here. Um, so my name is indeed Thomas, and I work at Atos in France. And I'll be talking about the noisy simulation of near-term intermediate scale quantum processors. OK. So exactly 100 years ago, a Norwegian engineer called Frederick Bull patented the first or one of the first mechanical punch card machines. The Bull company, which was uh, based on this patent, then uh, spent most of the 20th century designing HPC systems that took advantage of the first quantum revolution and the first, uh, uh, the first transistor that is shown on this picture. Now what the, the, the lab where I, where I work on uh, today wants to do is understand if and how quantum computers, be it, uh, be it based on superconducting qubits or trapped ions or semiconducting quantum dots or photonics, we want to understand if these uh, quantum processors can be useful uh, for HPC applications uh, in general. And uh, to reach that goal, we believe that uh, Software is very important. So this is a bit of a controversial slide um, uh, because here it's, a, it's more of a physicist audience. And we believe that good qubits are very important and they're a necessary condition to reach uh, uh, a useful quantum computer. But we also believe that building software around it is also very important. And there are many reasons for that. Um, first of all, um, there are very few known quantum algorithms. You all know of Shor's algorithm, Grover's algorithm, but in fact, it's, it's just a few tens of algorithms. And we believe that there's a lot uh, to be discovered here. Um, uh, and we see only the tip of the iceberg. And in order to, to speed up that process of development of new algorithms, you need software to help you program and validate new ideas in a very efficient way. Second, uh, we now live in the so-called NISC era with noisy uh, quantum computers. That's before fault tol tolerance, which would be for the long term. And um, in this NISC era, there are many important questions that one needs to address. Namely, how can we compile a program for a targeted hardware with its constraints? Can we design noise-resilient algorithms? And um, can we make something useful out of analog uh, devices, which are basically what is already now in physics labs? Or do we really need digital approaches? Or can we make a blend of both? Uh, to, to build something useful. And on the application side, so something which is not necessarily related to physics, um, I think we can claim that there are not yet killer apps uh, that have been identified uh, in, in the sense that there is not yet an application where it has been shown that a quantum computer of today with noise uh, can be useful. And this is something, and in order to understand whether such a killer app can, can, can occur um, or works, you need to have a platform to efficiently program a quantum and classical interface and test the, your ideas in a way that you know it will work the same way on a quantum processor uh, of the near future. So for this, you need to have simulation tools. You need to have programming tools and optimization tools. And this is um, um, what we propose uh, as a special, so we, we propose a special purpose classical simulator, which is called the quantum learning machine. It's not the, lear it's, it's not the machine learning, uh, it's, it has nothing to do with machine learning. It's really a machine that we see as a way to accelerate the process of learning how to program in the quantum world. And it comes uh, with quantum uh, programming libraries 
because we believe that if you want to, to build code in an efficient way, in the same way as when you write a C++ program, you don't have to write every time what is a plus, an addition, or a multiplication. We believe that uh, it should be the same for a quantum uh, program. You don't want to be, to have, you, you, the, the user doesn't need uh, to write directly all the gates. And we supply, for instance, routines like the quantum Fourier transform or oracles or custom and abstract gates so that you can really write your programs in an efficient way if you don't want to go down to the details of the gates. We also provide optimization strategies uh, in order to, um, to adjust or adapt your, your program to constraints of the architecture. And I will come back to that in a concrete fashion uh, 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 on, a, on a concrete example. And once you have optimized your circuit for a given architecture, you can simulate it either in a, an ideal fashion, in an exact way, in order to have a, an idea whether your ID works or not. And once you know that it works, at least in principle, we also provide noisy simulation tools uh, that come in, in various uh, ways. Um, so as you know, noisy simulation is a very difficult task. It's an exponential task. And so we provide simulators which are very efficient to perform that task. And uh, we also um, uh, provide application libraries where uh, if you don't want to program yourself the full quantum program and you want to play with ideas like variational quantum methods or quantum approximate uh, optimization algorithms, then we also provide these kind of, of, of libraries as Python libraries. So that if, if as a physicist you just want to, to play with these ideas and then specify that you, you, play, we ha you have a noisy simulator or a noisy QPU, uh, that, that you can do this full simulation in a few steps as I will show in the demonstration. And importantly, we also are compatible with other existing architectures so that if you want to run your algorithm once on your simulator and then just change, change the box that represents the simulator by an actual processor, like for instance, IBM's uh, uh, freely available uh, uh, processor, you can do it very efficiently with our machine. So you're really not stuck with a given language. You can uh, interchangeably go to other, uh, other languages. And just to give you an idea that we uh, do good work, um, so the simulator that we, that we propose is a special purpose uh, 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 simulator that has a lot of RAM. It has a couple of, couple of tens of terabytes of RAM, which is very different from a supercomputing architecture. You don't have to do open MPI. And therefore, if, when you see these, these, these results, so let's compare, for instance, the, the red curve is, is our simulator, one of our simulators. And the black curve here with stars is the same code uh, from IBM installed on our machine so that the comparison is fair. And you see that there's, an order of, uh, there's, there's a factor of 10 between the speeds of, of both results. And if you now look at the best result of IBM that they give using their own supercomputer on their website, they obtain this curve. So we are still faster than IBM, which may not make a lot of sense. But still, at the end, if you obtain your, your your computation in 10 times fa faster, you can do 10 times more. You can, ten, you can test 10 times more ideas. And uh, we have a, uh, so a couple of customers which are both academics. So for instance, national labs in the US like Oak Ridge or Argonne, as well as industrials like Total, which is an oil company who wants to understand before they can really put their hands on an actual quantum processor. They want to understand how to program it and whether with noise they can still get something out of it for, for the applications that they want to, to look into. So now, uh, since this session is called My Life in the Quantum, uh, quantum Industry, I'm going to give a very concrete example. Uh, at the beginning, I thought I would do an a on-life demo connecting to friends, but because of Brexit, I decided the connection was a bit unsure. So I will just show, uh, um, I will, I will just show um, uh, sli uh, uh, screenshots, but believe me, the, the, the time, it's, it's almost in instantaneous. Um, because I will take a very simple circuit, which is a, a five uh, qubit Fourier transform. So now, uh, just to give you a bit of background, so here I will take a digital example, so gate-based uh, model. Um, and this is a quantum Fourier transform. So if you open a textbook on, on quantum information theory, like the Nielsen and Schwang, you will see that a quantum Fourier transform can be realized by this circuit with a state preparation uh, where you can encode an, an input state. Then you apply uh, some gates, uh, Hadamard gate, control phase, et cetera, et cetera. And then you measure um, several times your state to get the output distribution. 
In theory, with this, with this uh, algorithm, you get exponential speed up over the fast rate transform, which is the, 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 most, uh, the, the, the quickest uh, algorithm known to date uh, for, for classical algorithms. And it's a very important uh, building block of the Shore algorithm, so that's something that is very important uh, for, for any application. The problem comes from the fact that in reality you have to, uh, to accommodate many constraints. First of all, on, on the left here, I put hardware constraints. Um, for instance, this is here uh, a typical connectivity graph of qubits. If you look at superconducting qubits, for instance, they, they are in a, in a plane. And you, you see here that qubit 0, for instance, doesn't talk to qubit 4. And if you want to accommodate that, uh, that constraints, you need to include swap gates in order that you can that you can apply uh, transformations between those qubits. And this increases your number of gates a lot. Then um, it, um, the native gates of some uh, uh, processors, like superconducting processors, do not include controlled phase gates. So that if you want to actually run your program on a quantum processor from IBM, for instance, you need to replace controlled phase gate by this pattern here, where instead of one uh, gate here, you obtain five gates including two, two qubit gates, two C0 gates. And this, this gives you a large gate count, which wouldn't be a problem if you had a perfect computer. But in fact, your quantum chip lives in a classical world and can be disturbed, uh, perturbed by a lot of, of things like electromagnetic fields, other energy levels, unwanted couplings. And therefore, your qubits can suffer, for example, from relaxation going from 1 to 0 or from dephasing. And therefore, you need to to, to finish your computation in a shorter time window before decoherence uh, kills uh, your quantum coherence. And you have to accommodate those constraints uh, when, you, when you write your quantum program. And um, what I'm going to show you here is a, is a typical workflow that a user has to go through in order to accommodate these constraints on the quantum learning machine. And here we take a very simple example with uh, so it's a quantum Fourier transform of, on five qubits, where the input signal is a stupid signal that I took with two harmonics, as you can see. And we expect, if we do the FFT of this signal, to obtain this result if, if we have an exact FFT. And the goal of this demonstration is to show you, with a, no, with a, with a simple noise model, what you should expect and how you can optimize your, your program uh, for such a simple example. So first, you have to write your program. And here is the, the syntax that we use to, to write a, a, a simple uh, quantum free transform. So as I said, we don't want you to, to, to have to write your full QFT yourself, although you can also do it. But here, we import a module called QFT. And also, if you want to prepare a given state given a, a vector of amplitudes, you can do it also using oracles. And here, you see that the program that, that I write here is separated in two parts, one which is a state preparation and one which is a QFT, and I split it in two in order to, to optimize both in an independent way. And the full circuit here uh, is plotted here, and you see that we obtain the, the circuit uh, that you find in, in textbooks. And now the first step is to translate the circuit into a circuit that can actually be run on a quantum computer. And as I said, um, you have to take into account the connectivity and replace uh, gates that have two qubits talk to each other that cannot. Uh, with swap gates. So that's what this first line does here. So you give the graph of the qubits, which is in this JSON file. And this optimizer here, which we call NNizer, will optimize the circuit and replace uh, all the, uh, and, and include swap gates whenever needed. This second line here replaces all control phase gate by the pattern that I, I put in the picture, phase, C0 phase, C0 phase. So it, it, it looks very simple, but the way that you do this, this, uh, this algorithm here with the graph has to be efficient, and this is something that is under uh, investigation and that is, uh, that, uh, is also uh, very important. And so, as you see here, the circuit that you obtain is very long, and to give you a more quantitative idea, here's a, a histogram of the length of the circuit, the gate count of the circuit. If you look at the textbook circuit, you have 16 gates. If you take into account connectivity only, you, you arrive at something like more than 120 gates. And if you include the limited gate set, you, you go to something like 160 gates. So you, there's a factor of 10 just taking into account this connectivity and gate set constraints. Now let's include noise. So here, there are lots of noise sources in a quantum computer. And here, for the sake of simplicity, I'm going to, be, to take a very simple example where gates are perfect and noise comes only when qubits are idle. 
And for idling times, what I'm going to do is add uh, relaxation and dephasing uh, noise in the form of T1 and T2 noise. So very simpli simplistic noise model, so it's very optimistic. But you see that already with that, you, you get pretty uh, poor results. So, and to do that, so you need to specify what is the, 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 the duration of your gates, because this is when uh, the, the, this will determine the idling times. And for this, you, go, you can go on the IBM web website, for instance, and look, oh, what is the, the duration of a Hadamard gate? What is the duration of Synod gate? You can also specify the T1 and T2 times that you can find also on the constructor's website. Construct your channels, your noisy channels here. And so these are basically uh, uh, objects that will construct the cross operators of, of the channel. And then specify your hardware model as a combination of the gates and the, the idle noise. And you could also add gate noise, etc. You could put noisy gates in a, in a very easy way. And if I now plot, taking into account these gate durations, the, sequence of the actual sequence of gates of this algorithm, you see that there are large portions of, of time here where the qubits are idle. And this is where noise will, will, uh, will destroy our results. And all the blue gates here are C0 gates. And we see basically only blue because C0 gates are the longest gates uh, in the algorithm. And uh, this is a bit of a busy, uh, of a busy uh, slide here. This is the actual computation where I just want you to look at uh, the way that we instantiate a simulator is, is by using this notation of a quantum processing unit, a QPU. And this, we did it in such a way that later, if you want, you can replace directly this QPU in your script by an actual QPU, for instance, by IBM or Rigetti or a photodotting chip, and, and that, will, that will work directly. And this is really our intent that you can benchmark your code on our simulator and then directly switch to an actual QPU uh, in a very easy way. And you see the final result here. The blue, the blue curve uh, is, the, is the perfect result if I have an ideal simulator. So this is, this is the blue curve that I expected. So this would be the, typical, the FFT result, basically. And if you now include the noise that I was talking about, you, you see that you, include, you have spurious peaks appearing here. And the order uh, of magnitude of errors that you get is the order of 20%. So it's a huge error rate just for a five qubit circuit. So you, you see that there's work to be done. And here I'm going to show you something uh, uh, to, to show you what one can do as a very simple way of improving those results. Um, I'm going to take into account the fact that I can commute some gates. And using these moves, so here it's a long list of, of different commutation uh, patterns that I can use. Using these commutation patterns, I'm going to try to optimize a cost function that I can choose. And here I chose a very simple cost function here, which I call a metric, which takes the circuit as an input and, and returns the total idling time as an output. And now using an, uh, an optimization technique, which here in this case is a, is a simulated annealing technique, I'm going to, to use this move to reduce this cost function. And, let's, and, and uh, it, takes a couple of, it, it takes, in this case, uh, 10 seconds. And the results that we obtain are the following. So let's, see, let's look at this histogram, which presents the fidelity as a function so, of the different, uh, uh, the different circuits. So if I have a universal circuit or universal uh, hardware with a complete gate set and, 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 tot and uh, infinite connectivity, I obtain a fidelity which is really high. It's a very small circuit, five qubit. If I take into account connectivity only, then my fidelity drops to 80% roughly. If I now take into account also the fact that the gate set is limited, the, 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 the fidelity uh, drops to something like 70, 76%. And if I now use uh, this optimization that I just presented by annealing, uh, the, the result, um, the fidelity increases to something like 84%. So it's not perfect, but it's just a 10 second computation. So there's, and it's a very small circuit, so there is not a lot of, of leeway to, to do the optimization. So it's just to, to explain to you that in a few lines of Python, you can do these optimizations and then try to test them on the actual hardware, which is probably the next step that, that we should do. And probably it won't look like this because the C0 gates in, in the IBM hardware have a pretty poor fidelity at the moment. And this is it. So if you have any questions, I'm, I'm happy to, to answer. Thank you, Thomas. It's very interesting. Uh, are, there, are there any questions? Please, uh, just wait for the microphone to get to you.
Hi, thank you for the talk. Uh, can you comment on which methods were you using on the simulations uh, that you were doing in the examples? Noisy case, non-noisy case? So, so here the non-noisy non case is a very simple simulation method where uh, so basically we represent uh, the, the, the vector, the psi vector as, as 2 to the n amplitudes and we do brute force simulation using matrix vector multiplication. For the part uh, on the noisy simulation, we also do something really straightforward because it's just a five qubit example. So we can afford to allocate the two to the five times two to the five density matrix and just do the uh, straightforward uh, manipulation. But for larger circuits, we use a, a, a variety of, of other methods, like for instance, uh, using uh, physics inspired MPS representation for the state vector or the density matrix, in which case it would be called MPO rather than MPS. And that allows us to reach much larger number of qubits. And for noisy simulation, we can also use quantum trajectories like methods to reach also large number of qubits. By, by trajectories, you mean the standard PSP space simulation method where you compute? Let's say it's a, it's a variation on, on the, the quantum trajectory method which is used for the Lindblad <laughs> equation, for instance. Thank you. Cool. We have time for one more question, Josh. Thank you. I have a, a higher level question for you. This is uh, some work that I had uh, zero visibility on before, uh, so thank you for presenting it. Um, how far will classical quantum simulation go? You know, in five years' time, how many qubits can we expect to be able to reasonably simulate? So, the, so it's, a hard, it's a hard question and a good question. Um, of course, we hope that we can go very far on the one hand, but we also hope that probably you catch up. So there's lots of progress on classical simulation and a lot of, of ideas actually taken from the quantum world to dequantize an algorithm to, to go, to, go to, to larger, to, to larger qubit count, for instance. And this is something that we look actively into, of course. And so there's really no telling. I hope that in a way that if we want to continue selling this machine, that it's not yet. But on the other hand, I'm quite, I, I hope that also a quantum processor emerges that actually makes, has a better scale. Yes, for us on the other side of the table, it's uh, very much a case of trying to anticipate where the moving target will be by the time we actually get hardware that is competitive. Yes. Uh, so it's an interesting question. Indeed. Yeah. All right, good, thank you. And also simulating noisy uh, quantum processors is even harder. So that's also something that uh, has, one has to keep in mind. Cool. Thank you, Josh. Let's thank Thomas again. <laughs>